Good evening, everyone. So as our guests take our, their seats, um, I'm Harold Holzer, and uh, I'm the director of Roosevelt House. And it's a pleasure and an honor for us to welcome you to this, what I'm told is the 15th discussion among the candidates for the speakership, and the last, which so makes them really excited, uh, that this is the climactic moment of their discussions. So we're gathered, for those of you who've never been in this auditorium, we're gathered to, uh, in this wonderful found space that lives here within the home that Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt occupied from 1908 until Franklin left uh, to assume the presidency in 1933. This was, thinking back for comparative purposes to recent history, this was the transition headquarters for the Roosevelt administration. No comparisons offered, but this was the place where Franklin Roosevelt conceived of the threads that made, made up the New Deal. Social Security, minimum wage, the Works Progress Administration, all originated a couple of floors up in his library in meetings with practitioners and experts and future members of his cabinet. So it, it's a history that imbues us all day and every day as we have public events and meet with students. And I hope it inspires uh, a good discussion tonight, uh, especially on this focus. Uh, as some of you may know, earlier this week we hosted a discussion on the issue of the legal challenge to the ban on transgender people serving in the military. We had Chase Strangio here, who is the transgender attorney who is representing th the ACLU challenge to the president's ban. So it's appropriate that uh, as we continue this week, we're, we're having this discussion here. And that's one of the reasons why we're so pleased to host it at Roosevelt House, um, not only because of the four freedoms that Roosevelt crafted and that are emblazoned on our wall back there. As you all know, I hope Eleanor Roosevelt was the chair of the UN committee that codified those aspirations into the International Declaration of Human Rights. And she probably would have responded to this debate tonight and this focus by re-quoting her famous quote, uh, justice cannot be for one side alone, it must be for all. So that's another Eleanor uh, inspiration. We are really honored that our friends at Girls for Gender Equity came to us and asked if they could host this debate here in these hallowed halls. And um, oh, I'm so glad that our, that our councilman elect is here because I get to make the joke that I had to put to the side. <laughs> Keith, there's a seat for you right here. So I was going to say that we're really honored that among this wonderful packed house is the one voting member of the audience, <laughs> our councilman-elect from this area, Keith Powers. Anyway, we're honored to be joined by seven of the eight declared members of uh, the council who have announced their candidacy for the speakership. And I'm going to... Um, do their names in alphabetical order. Robert Cornegi from Brooklyn, Corey Johnson from Manhattan, Mark Levine from Manhattan, Donovan Richards from Queens, Idanis Rodriguez from Manhattan, Jimmy Van Bramer from Queens, and Jumani Williams from Brooklyn. Um, so now let me turn over the mic to someone who, um, who really is one of the inspirations for this event. Joanne Smith is the founder and executive director of Girls for Gender Equity. She moves the organization toward its mission every day through strategic advocacy, leadership cultivation, and other areas. Um, she is, she co-chaired the nation's first young women's initiative for girls of color in New York City. She's a steering committee member of the Black Girl Movement and a movement maker uh, with the organization Move to End Violence, a 10-year initiative uh, designed to strengthen the collective capacity to end gender-based violence within the United States. Um, 
She's featured uh, on the summer 2016 gender justice issue of Yes Magazine, sharing her experience and her experiences about intersectional feminism. Um, it's wonderful to invite her up. Oh, her principal claim to fame is that she's an alumna of Hunter College's Graduate School of Social Work. Please welcome Joanne Smith. Good evening. Harold, thank you for that, and thank you again for uh, hosting this event. Uh, this first and this only New York City Council Speaker Candidate Forum, and yes, the last. Uh, we expect you to leave it all uh, on the cutting room floor, <laughs> especially tonight as we really take a deep dive and focus on trans and gender nonconforming young people, on cis girls and young women of color in New York City, um, on the lives of young people uh, who oftentimes are at their most vulnerable points when dealing uh, with systems and with culture, but are often the leaders and the forerunners um, uh, leading cultural revolution, um, standing up for injustices, and um, being brilliant you know, in their own right, especially once given opportunities um, and obstacles are removed. So um, we look forward to really uh, challenging, especially you all as cis men who are here representing the speakership, right? And uh, we look forward to really uh, getting a sense of uh, what it, where it is that you come from uh, with these issues, what you have done, and your vision, right? Uh, what are the strategies that you have learned uh, about from other organizations? Have you learned about from your community? What are you willing to take on um, to address the issues that most impact uh, trans and non-binary youth and um, gender non-conforming youth? We're in the final weeks of City Council member Melissa Mark Deverito's speakership, and we know right now it's a critical moment in the nation, right? It's a critical moment around gender discrimination and violence. Um, we have millions right now saying me too when it comes to experiencing patriarchy at its ugliest. This is a watershed moment and it, we're here to expose and hold accountable and dismantle the systems and the cultural biases that breed rape culture and sexual violence. And we're here to do that with the intersectional analysis and a recentering of youth voices. I mean, even tonight, we have our very own time people person of the year, Tarana Burke. Mm -hmm. To help, to help really hold accountable our moral compass as a nation um, and shift it. And so, Speaker Mark, Melissa Mark Viverito sought to do that during her term. She made New York City the first in the nation to lead a young women's initiative. Under her leadership, the New York City Council sought to identify gaps of services for young people, with young women and girls ages 12 to 24 years old with a focus on women of color and trans youth and gender nonconforming young people. Now seven other cities right, are following that lead, this, na this national initiative that was birthed here in New York City. Today, several candidates who are here to secede her are gathered here, and they really have big shoes to fill. They have big shoes to fill. So we'll first have our first male speaker in over a decade, right, filling this position, and fewer women will be in city council. Most of the women's committee members will be leaving. And so because of this, it's especially critical uh, to know that they're firmly and tangibly committed to the well-being of young women in TGNC youth of color. So we at Girls for Gender Equity, at the Women of Color for Progress, at Brooklyn Movement Center, at the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Community Center, at Power Her NY, at Planned Parenthood of New York City, the National Organization for Women of New York City, the New Leaders Council, the New Institute for Reproductive Health, Brotherhood, Sister Soul, the, Cam <laughs> the Campaign for Black Male Achievement, the Citizens Committee for Children, Eleanor's Legacy, and the National Association of Social Workers, New York City Chapter, call on the next speaker to boldly join government's leaders 
advocates, policy experts, and youth to combat, to combat systemic inequities experienced by young people. New York City deserves nothing less from our speaker and expect that you'll be willing to champion the progressive strategies that have come before you, be willing to uplift and put in place policies and practices that will transform the lives of our young people in this city. Tonight's forum will be moderated by politicals Laura Namos. Namos, okay, close. Uh, and Shatia Burks of New York City Young Women's Initiative. And just to tell you a little bit about Laura and Shatia, Laura is a reporter for the Politico New York, covering City Hall and Mayor Bill de Blasio. Before she began covering City Hall last summer, she wrote about Albany politics for Politico New York. She has also written for the city and state, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Post. A native of Memphis, Tennessee, Laura earned her undergraduate degree from Wellesley University in Connecticut before earning a master's degree in journalism at Columbia University. Shatia, Shatia, I'm a, you know, I'm an adult fan, right? Shatia is leading the way in the moment, not even in the future, just right now as a young person in New York. And uh, many of you may remember her from uh, speaker Melissa Mark Viverito's city. Uh, right, city of state announcement, or city of city announcement. Uh, she's, say to the city. Well good, you're on it already, look at that. <laughs> Shatia Burks is an alumni of the New York City Council's Young Women's Advisory Council that was part of the Young Women's Initiative. Burks served as a youth expert for the Young Women's Initiative Community Support and Opportunity Work Group, helping address the needs of young women and girls living in poverty. Burks dedicated herself to ensuring the intimate Cater, the, cater to economic, that the initiative cater to economically disadvantaged young women holistically. She pushes others to remain resilient, strive for excellence, and achieve their goals. And so tonight you're joined by the best as they moderate this panel and really um, ask the burning questions that will come through uh, the audience uh, that have been drafted by the organizations that uh, really came together to bring this event together and that will come through Twitter and Facebook um, in real time. And so I welcome to the stage Laura and Shatia. Um, hi, uh, I'm Laura Namias from Politico New York. Um, and thank you so much for having two Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. It's an honor, and it's an honor to uh, to interview all of you guys and, and hear what you have to say. Yeah, and good evening. I'm Shatia Burks. It's an honor to be here, and I'll be giving you the start of your show. <laughs> <laughs> so here's how today's program will go. First, you'll hear council members' introductions. Then Laura and I will ask a couple of long-form questions focused on council leadership and issues across the areas of health, economic development, anti-violence and criminal justice, community support and opportunity. And then we'll have an audience lightning round followed by a social media lightning round. Finally, we'll have to do a closing round. Here are some notes for audience and viewers. Please submit your questions via index cards by 7 p.m. Submit questions via social media using the hashtag SheWillBe and hashtag GenderEquityNYC. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna give all of you each a minute, uh, which is really a long time, um, to introduce yourselves and uh, tell everyone here who you are and, and a little bit about yourself, um, starting with uh, Councilman Cornegy. Good evening, my name is uh, Council Member Robert Cornegy. I represent the vibrant communities of Bedford-Stuyvesant and Crown Heights. <laughs> bed Stuy is in the house, okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, Crown Heights is in the house, okay. Um, I guess one of the important things about myself is that I am a husband and father of six. Um, so there's a lot of jokes that could be associated with that that <laughs> you probably won't go into. But um, I have had the pleasure of working in a very progressive council and have had progressive issues that were germane to my community and women's uh, health and reproductive, reproductive health uh, that were important to me. I, uh, most have the distinction of having the first public lactation station in the state of New York, 
and consequently have authored legislation that makes lactation stations available in public buildings uh, across the city of New York. I'm, I'm very proud of that. Um, I ran on a campaign of a woman's right to choose and marriage equality in a largely ecumenical community. Uh, and based on that, uh, won by probably the slimmest margin uh, in New York City in 2013 by 68 votes, uh, but was really um, bent on making sure that, that that voice could be carried loudly. Uh, and basically, um, I co-chair uh, the Men Who Get It Caucus at the New York City Council. Uh, good evening, I'm Corey Johnson. It's so nice to be here with all of you. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you about my district and where I come from. I think we'll talk about that probably during some of the questions tonight. But I just wanna say I'm so glad we're having this forum that's focused on uh, these issues. You know, I'm an openly gay man. Uh, I'm the only openly HIV positive elected official in the state of New York. And the issues that I think that are gonna be talked about tonight with regard to uh, trans women, um, you know, uh, and, and issues related to non-binary folks in New York City are deeply important and issues that really matter to me. Uh, I think the bill that I'm most proud of that I passed over the last four years was a bill allowing transgender New Yorkers to get accurate birth certificates and to correct their birth certificates. That's probably my proudest achievement in the council when it comes to legislation. There's an epidemic of violence against trans women of color in New York City. Uh, and people are getting murdered. And these are issues that are really important to talk about, especially as men. Um, and so I look forward to having this discussion tonight. Thank you. Um, Councilman Levine, uh, would you mind, and would all the rest of the council members mind standing up when you speak, just so that the people who are watching on the live stream, Without sorry. <laughs> Council District, and I'm not going to tell you anything about my district now either, except one little fact, which we are home to the world famous Brotherhood Sister Soul, which is here tonight. <laughs> Thank you for coming out. Uh, you know, I just want to remark that the, the fact that the eight people running for council speaker are all men uh, reflects uh, a failing of the political system in New York City, uh, and <laughs> we're very we're very quick to criticize other parts of the country, but this is a failing that originates in New York in politics and society here and one we have to correct um, before the next cycle in 2021 and one we have to deal with in the next four years to empower women in the body. Um, I think it does obligate the eight of us um, to rein in the hubris a little bit and do more listening than dictating. Uh, and I know tonight is about us speaking out and we have an obligation to do that. Um, but uh, I think my colleagues all share the notion that um, we need to listen now that, that women need to be heard, that trans people need to be heard, that non-conforming people need to be heard now more than ever. And I certainly look forward to that conversation tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Councilmember Richards. I'm going to follow Councilmember Levine's lead. Uh, I am a proud representative of Southeast Queens, Rosedale, Laurelton, Springfield Gardens, and the Rockaways. And I just want to echo that it is shameful that there is not a woman in this race uh, this year, and, and a lot of that, once again, has to do with our political system. I do also want to say that uh, the next speaker is going to have an obligation to make sure that not only are we hearing from women, but that we are, are ensuring that they are in leadership positions in the council that mean something uh, to this city. So when we look at committees, when we look at divvying up leadership roles in the budget negotiating team, committees, it is going to be critical that women are at the, the forefront of leadership roles uh, in the council because once again, we're not women, but we have an obligation to hear and to ensure that uh, leadership is reflected uh, in the council that will ensure that the issues, which every issue in the city is a woman issue and that those issues are reflected at the forefront uh, of the council's uh, policy uh, driven things, but also uh, in, in terms of uh, funding initiatives and other things as well. So I look forward to the discussion today. We have a lot of work to do in the city, and I look forward to supporting that work. Thank you to the organizers for bringing us together. I'm one of those New Yorkers born and raised in another country. So I'm one of those 38% who know what it is to come here at the age of 18 
living poverty back in the island of Paniola, raising a family of 12 brothers, 12 brothers and sisters. The oldest one, there were seven women first. So the oldest one was the last one being married. Her commitment was to be a role model for the rest of the sisters and for the youngest one. I believe that we have a responsibility to work hard to leave our society better for the future generation. As it has been said before, women issues are transaction, transactions. This is, about, this is not about one particular issue. This is about opportunity to have to be paid equal. This is about having control of the body. This is about opportunity to have in position, to be in position of leadership. If I will become the speaker, I will be that person that will continue following the legacy that we have from the great speaker, Melissa Marbiberito. Thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Jimmy Van Bramer from uh, Western Queens. When I was about 10 or 11 years old, I realized I was a little bit different than the other boys, uh, partly because I had a crush on Steven Stratajakis, um, who was really, <laughs> really adorable. And, um, and it took me a decade uh, to come out of the closet, but when I came out of the closet and I decided I was gonna fight for my freedom, I remember women at the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community center tell me that your struggle for freedom is connected to our struggle for freedom. And being a gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, civil rights activist also means that you're an activist for choice uh, and for a woman's right to choose. And the two of them are inseparable. So I've always believed in that. That's always been a core bedrock philosophy of who I am. And so in my work in the city council, I'm really proud that before I was a council member, there was no Planned Parenthood Health Center in Queens serving two and a half million people. And I insisted that it be in my district. There is a Planned Parenthood Health Center in Queens right now, providing the full range of services for women, men, the trans community. Also, many of you have heard there is now a Girl Scout troop for homeless girls, the first ever of its kind in New York City. I was really proud to help found that Girl Scout troop, Troop 6000 for Homeless Girls. I want to bring that kind of leadership on behalf of all women, all in the trans community, as your next speaker. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is uh, Jamani Williams, Councilman for the 45th District. Thank you for having this. I'm just uh, pleased to be here and so happy that this group has allowed uh, the voices that sometimes get left out to be the ones in the forefront, uh, trans, TGNC, uh, cis women of color. That's amazing. Thank you. I didn't hear anyone talk about women's wish issues because I know that's refreshing because uh, all women, all issues are women's issues. We know that. So we shouldn't be talking about how to put women's issues forward. We need to be making sure that women are involved in all things that we discuss, and that's the way uh, that I want to move forward on doing so. I'm proud of so many bills that I ha hope to talk s about uh, during this day. Uh, but I want to make sure uh, I say a few things. One, I think most of us are going to give uh, similar answers uh, to the questions. One thing I want to say about myself uh, is that I'm battle-tested to move forward. Uh, city and state uh, labeled me as the second most productive council member in the council behind the speaker the number one most productive uh, speaker candidate that's running. Uh, and I believe not only in quantity, meaning uh, the most legislation passed by any member beside the speaker, quality, dense, I probably passed the most controversial bills uh, in the city council without dividing the body. And I would love to have a discussion if anyone wants to challenge uh, what I'm saying, but it's important, because in this time of Trump, of where we are now, we need someone who's not gonna fold. We need someone who's gonna stand strong. I have a history of doing that, and would love to help you uh, uh, talk about that today. Thank you. Shall we get started then? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna start with Council Member um, Kornicki. The city is often the only level of government that is proactive in protecting access to abortion and other reproductive health care. With the city council taking the lead for over 15 years, how will you work to ensure access to clinics, protect New Yorkers from pre predatory crisis pregnancy centers, and safeguard insurance coverage for, contra for contraception? Just the, the last part, would you ask again? How will you protect New Yorkers from predatory crisis pregnancy centers and safeguard insurance coverage for contraception? So cer certainly, you know, in partnership. Oh, I said stand my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, one of the biggest problems that we face is um, not protecting those individuals who seek services in these, in these crisis pregnancy centers. 
And I think that a partnership with law enforcement that has a focus on that as an issue is important. And putting the resources and making sure there's even a, a, a special unit that's designed to deal directly with the trauma associated with having to exit and enter and protect those, it, it would be a priority, has been a priority for me and will continue to be a priority as a speaker. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so uh, on all three points, number one, the council I think has done a really good job at coming up with money in the budget annually to uh, support organizations like Planned Parenthood and other groups that work on reproductive choice and reproductive health issues. And I would of course continue that and support that uh, we have to put together lists every year of our priorities, and Planned Parenthood is always on my list that I put forward to ask for an increase in money when we're deciding the budget. Crisis pregnancy, uh, crisis pregnancy centers, I know that Councilmember Lappin, when she was in the council, took on these uh, quackery, phony groups that try to take advantage of unsuspecting uh, folks that are in a bad spot and are looking for help and we need to do all we can to rein them in. There have been court cases around it. It's been litigated, I believe, at the federal level. The council still has to keep pushing the envelope. And then lastly, uh, places like Planned Parenthood and other places where women can go to get an abortion, these protesters that are out front, the police need to do more to ensure that there is no violence or intimidation against women when they go to get a safe and legal abortion. Well. I, I love the way you frame this question uh, because at a time when the national government is run by uh, a misogynist uh, in the White House and congressional leadership which is uh, openly and avowedly opposed to uh, women's reproductive rights, to trans rights, at a time when, when states around the country in many cases are, are assaulting these very same rights. Um, we do, thank goodness, control local government in the city. Uh, we have progressive leadership at, on both sides of City Hall. And so we have an obligation to protect the people of the city, uh, the women of the city, uh, trans New Yorkers, uh, gender nonconforming New Yorkers, to protect our values and to use our resources to fill the gaps that are left by, uh, by assaults from the federal government. And uh, that in part means that we're going to need to spend if um, benefits like contraception are cut out of the health plans that so many New Yorkers rely on, then we as a city are gonna have to make access to that available. Um, and we need to be in our schools and our jails and our universities providing the medical care, the health care that women need. And we need to fight back against the demonization, demonization of Planned Parenthood by funding it, by celebrating it, by allowing access, by protecting the women uh, who are seeking whatever uh, medical care or other services they are there. The city government can and must do that, and the speaker needs to be very firm in leading the body towards those goals. This will be top on my agenda in the next four years and must be for the entire body. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'll start with the first thing. First off, communities uh, like mine are certainly being underserved. So I think one of the things uh, we should certainly, certainly be looking at, in particular for communities like the Rockaways, communities of color, who quite naturally aren't even getting the services and have to travel to Long Island City um, to get services, we need to look at expanding centers around the city first and foremost into the core communities uh, that where people are living in the shadows because they, they don't have uh, particular places to gather. I'll say secondly that we have an obligation to push uh, the police department to do their jobs. And whether that means a dedicated stream of funding or unit or something that uh, sets people right outside those centers to protect uh, people's own uh, right to do what they wish uh, is going to be uh, important as well. I'll say thirdly, funding organizations, organic organizations located in pockets of our city that, are, that don't exist right now, I mean, who are receiving very little funding is going to also be important as well. We have to build capacity in communities that are underserved and right now, that is not being done. There are people in my community who are living in the shadows. I had the pleasure of visiting a center just a few weeks ago uh, where it was very evident to me that the work is not being done the way it needs to, and we're gonna have to make sure that our budget priorities uh, speak loud in the next council as well. First of all, I've been at the council for a year, 
and working under Kristen Quinn and now Melissa Marverito, we've been big supporter of Planned Parenthood. That's what we need to continue doing in our city, working with those institutions that work very hard 24-7, not only in those, in those centers that we have now, but to continue expanding those centers throughout our city of New York. I was a co-founder of a school in 1993 after graduating from City College. The same year when Chancellor Fernandez you know, was on the attack because he wanted to create, to introduce sex education in our schools. This is something that also we need to be sure. First of all, that we go after those centers that are misleading our women when they are decided to take a decision related to the control of their body. Second, to continue supporting parenthood. And third, being sure that we educate our students so that they get to get more information about the decision that they make with the body that belongs to them. Thanks. So as I mentioned in my opening, uh, I have a, a proven record of, of making sure that Planned Parenthood's services are expanded. Uh, uh, there's a few people in this room who were there when Planned Parenthood first came to my office and said, you know, we're thinking of opening up a center uh, because there is none in Queens serving two and a half million people, uh, but we wanted to talk to you and see if you would be uh, approving of that before we go any further. And I said, not only do I approve it, but it has to be in my district. I will fight to get this Planned Parenthood Health Center in my district, and we did. And then when they needed another $500,000 or so in capital money, we went and we got that funding so that Planned Parenthood could open and provide the full range of services. On the second issue, uh, I have been there at the front uh, of health centers that provide abortion services. Uh, I have been walking in with someone very close to me who was seeking those services and knowing how painful a day that was in her life for her to encounter what she encountered was disgraceful and outrageous and we should absolutely do everything we can to push those people back and make sure that they are not uh, victimizing women who are going to get health services. And the third part is all contraceptives should be covered absolutely 100% and if they're not, the city council should make sure they are. Thank you. Uh, in the opening statement, I didn't get to mention something I, I said before uh, in another uh, debate, which is one, all men running, I apologize. Um, and, uh, and I mean that sometimes partially just, but mostly really seriously. And I said it before, just recognizing my own privilege as a cisgendered male, any contribution I made to an environment that made women feel that they could not run. And so we have to recognize our privilege here and making sure we're addressing that environment and whatever we're doing, and I mean that sincerely. To the question, uh, most uh, because we're the city, uh, not a lot of things come before the body to vote on. Obviously, we're in the age of an orange man who's doing a lot of crazy things, and the city is important that we do whatever we can creatively. One of those was the crisis uh, pregnancy centers. Uh, my father, God rest his soul, was a physician. My mother is a, a pharmacist. My sister's a nurse. I understand the differences, and to me, it's not about personal whatever, it's about whether you're trying to deceive someone. They absolutely were, so I was happy to vote against uh, what it was that they're doing. I agree, uh, if someone is going to get a service, uh, they should be protected. We wanna make sure they are protected without the rowdy protesters around them. Lastly, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, getting a bill passed the next session that I put forward, commonly called the Boss Bill, uh, which will prevent uh, any retaliation or discrimination uh, from a supervisor or an employer to an employee based on their reproductive um, decisions. Uh, I was appalled to find out that that was ev not even against the law in this city. Thank you. Um, <coughs> okay, moving right along. Uh, and, and please, um, there are two people here with signs telling you when the time's up. Just try to stay as close to uh, the amount of time that we have as possible um, while obviously finishing your thought. Um, I'm going to start with, we're doing like a, a round robin sort of thing. I'm gonna start with you, Council Member Johnson, on education. Uh, how will your educational priorities ensure that all students, especially those who face more obstacles, such as students who are parents, students who are subject to being pushed out of school because of what some people say are racially biased disciplinary policies, students in foster care, low-income students, undocumented students, and LGBT and gender non-conforming students receive the education they need to succeed as adults. And please be specific. 
Okay, I'm gonna tell you my story very, very quickly in 20 seconds. <laughs> I came out when I was 16 years old in Massachusetts in 1999. I was the only openly gay student in a school of 1,500 kids. I became captain of the football team, so I was in a position of privilege in coming out in that position. And that experience is what got me involved in activism, which got me involved in politics. All of those groups you mentioned are folks that really need our help. They're the most marginalized, oppressed, and disadvantaged group in the city of New York. What we need to do is ensure that we're not being punitive against students in school, but are actually being uh, supportive and rehabilitative. It's about mediation, it's about meeting people where they are, it's about getting people the support that they need, and it's not about being punitive. DOE, uh, Councilmember Drum, came up with an LGBT liaison, which has been doing trainings all throughout the school system, which is great. Councilmember Gibson and I passed a bill that goes to school safety agents and what they should be doing with underserved students in the, in the, in the school system. My track record is great on it. I, I want to learn from all of you about what else I should be doing on those issues. Thank you. Well, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in the community school model, which provides not just educational services, but mental health services, medical services, eye care services, social work services in the school building where this is done right around the city. It does help marginalized young people um, succeed in the academic setting. It helps all children. And I do want to mention about the challenge of bullying and the, 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 uh, the frequent entanglement with homophobia that this unfortunate phenomena um, uh, is associated with in our schools, as we saw most dramatically in the terrible incident at Bronx High, uh, High School of Wildlife Studies. Um, and I don't think that our school system and our school leadership has adequately acknowledged the role that bias plays in bullying, and that particularly young people who are gender nonconforming, who are trans, who are struggling with their identity at an age which is difficult for everybody, are subjected often to the most humiliating treatment by peers, and that's a failure of adults who do not support those young people, um, and often it's a failure of a system that tells those adults that they could be punished if they intervene in such cases. So we need a reckoning with that, and we need to do better by young people of all backgrounds in our schools. I'll say community schools is certainly the answer. I've seen it working right in my own uh, district in particular. I have a school, uh, QIRT, which is located in the Far Rockaway High School campus. When I got elected, their graduation rate was something around 52%. And what we've seen happening over the course of uh, the last three years is graduation rates soar up nearly 20%. It's at around 72% now. Why? Because the school is offering wraparound services to students. So things around immigration, uh, GED help, not just for the students, but also for the parents. We have a health clinic uh, located right in the school. So even if you're uninsured, not only does the student have access to it, but the parent has access to it. Um, uh, vocational training, all of these things are being offered uh, in this ecosystem in the school, and it's really helping uh, to nurture the students who, in particular in the Rockaways, don't have access uh, to many of these things. So I would say the expansion of community schools, certainly more resources. I put a million dollars in the school myself to build out a computer lab. They're learning something called Cisco within the school, which is your Time Warner box programming and actually leaving with certification uh, so that they can actually go in right into working in industry as well, which is a way to lift them up economically. So I think community schools is certainly an important model here. I can be the speaker that I can share with you that I have a role model in Northern Manhattan. But for the first time, all elementary schools in our history, they are in good standard in school district six. That has been happening in the last four years. Before I came here, I was at the American Museum applying to my daughter's school science program. Starting in sixth grade, it's a seven year commitment. Most of the kids applying there does not represent women, female, and a student of color. I will make every single school in New York City community school, no need to expand it. Because if, you, if any child live in a zip code, where it's a more middle class and upper middle class, they are community school by the program that the school offer after school and weekend. I know that coding technology is leaving behind women and a student of color. 
We have the most segregated education system in the whole nation. It's a shame for all of us. We have to start educational civil rights movement in January, January 2018 so that we can address what it is that we need to do to take the necessary step to close the gap of quality education for every single child. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think we all agree, look, racism, sexism, uh, uh, transphobia, homophobia prevent young people from being who they want to be and who they are and actually prevent them from achieving uh, in school unless we are actually actively doing something uh, to combat those things in the schools and giving those young people the space uh, to be who they are and to succeed. And when I was in Bryan High School, uh, Corey, I was not on the football team, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> um, uh, but instead, I actually went through the darkest period of my life where I was near suicidal because I didn't want to go to school, right? I absolutely stopped going to school lying to my mother and telling her I was going to school, but actually going to the top of our apartment building and spending the day on the roof. I preferred to do that than going to school because I was tired of hearing everyone yell gay boy or faggot and all of those things. Now we know that young people experience that every day in school on so many different levels in so many different ways. All of us have to make sure that that stops once and for all and all children are safe to go to school. My mom happens to be a woman, and uh, <laughs> when you speak about intersectionality, strong black woman, uh, with this issue in particular having to do with school and raising two knucklehead kids by herself, because my the dad, rest his soul, made another choice. I have Tourette's syndrome, ADHD. I'm a Brooklyn public school baby. Uh, if my mother wasn't who she was, uh, I wouldn't be here. Uh, she was allowed to be involved, and my teachers who cared about me were allowed to be involved, and that's something I think we need to bring back to it. If it wasn't, not that there's anything wrong with the special education, but young black boys, the troubled ones, that's the path they go. And thanks to my mother, uh, that didn't happen. Uh, to the question in particular, the biggest thing that I think we can do is change how we're educating. If the groups that were discussed are not in the curriculum, uh, then people are not being taught about them. And one of the biggest things that I've learned uh, is when you learn about people, you learn that they're just people, and the fear begins to go away. So all the things my colleagues said are true, and we have to do, but changing the curriculum is a, s supremely important. I don't know what I would have done without my mother's supplemental education, so I can learn more about just than Rosa Parks, I can learn about Fannie Lou Hamer, I can learn about Angela Davis, supplementing that education so I can learn an entirety of who people are and make sure my mind frame uh, is not myopic. So unfortunately, we still live in the most segregated education system in the country. And when we talk about segregation, generally we're talking about ethnicity. But there are these subtle nuances in segregation that allow for bullying and discrimination and biases as it relates to sexual orientation. And until we're ready to address that from a DOE level perspective, we're going to still have these problems. So there are schools that have been developed that are that are designed to deal directly with certain demographics, but it almost feels like isolation. So until we're ready to have an integrated system that's for every type of student, no matter what their sexuality is, no matter what their religion or race is, we're going to struggle. Now, I'm blessed to have a community school in my district, and I've watched uh, at Boys and Girls High School, and I watched how those integrative services have been essential in the growth and development and empowerment of young people. So young people who came in without the access to services now are more confident or, medi or more ready to address issues that they face. And I think that's the answer that we need to be looking at. Thank you. Okay, next we'll have economic and workforce development. I'm going to start with you, Councilmember Levine. In this political moment, sexual harassment at work, a long-time reality for cis and trans women and GNC folks is finally being pushed into the forefront. Founder of the Me Too movement, Tarana Burke, head of the programs of Girls for Gender Equity, helped pave the way. The city council sets an example when it comes to safe and, safe and healthy workplaces. What is a model policy for addressing sexual harassment in workplaces in schools? Well, at a time when we're in the midst of a very long overdue but painful reckoning on this issue that we've seen play out 
uh, in Hollywood, and in the newsrooms, uh, in, in Congress, in the White House, um, we would be dangerously naive to think that our own workforce here in New York City is immune from that. Um, and we need to deal with that openly and transparently now. And uh, I have been pushing some policy, policy together with Majority Leader Van, Van Bramer to ensure that our city government lives up to the highest standards, that our city council workforce lives up to the highest standards, so that survivors feel heard, so that they get information, and so that our city can understand these trends. And very, very briefly, because I know I'm out of time, I'll say that we have several bills moving that are gonna require a reporting from every agency in New York City on the number of incidents of sexual harassment. We don't have that today, and require that at the city council we set an even higher standard so that when staff, um, when there are cases of sexual abuse by staff, that that is reviewed at the highest level, which is our committee on ethics something which until now we've reserved only for abuse by elected officials, and I'll talk more about that when I have more time. First off, I'll start by saying there should be zero tolerance for this behavior. If you engage in this behavior, you need to be gone, whether you're staff, whether you're elected, zero tolerance. Um, secondly, I think there needs to be somewhat of an independent person or body or agency that really handles these particular uh, complaints when people make them. You know, one of the things we're seeing at the federal level when you look at Congress is that the system is designed to victimize the victim. And we have to make sure that there's an independent body that people feel comfortable going to to make these complaints. There should be no bureaucracy. When you make a complaint, you should feel like you're really being heard, and these things should be investigated right rapidly. Not next month, right away, uh, we need to investigate and take action uh, to ensure that we're protecting our workforce here right in New York City. But I think the most important thing is to send a message that we will have zero tolerance for this uh, in New York City. Sexual harassment is una sector, but it doesn't matter where it happened. I think that there should be independence office where everyone should be mandated to report. We shouldn't be passing the information or sharing the information in the same agency. I know that in the DOE, I used to be a teacher for 13 years, and with this one case of sexual harassment, teachers did not report it to the garden council, to the principal. You need to make the phone call directly to the central office. I think that this is something that can help us because we have to send the message loud and clear that there's consequences. But also, we need to do more education in our school. You know, a lot of things happen on how human beings are conditioning to how they are accepted in their life. What is the other people, the level of control that other people, especially in a still macho society where we live. We need to be sure that our children are raised with those value, understanding that everyone, that in order to accept any type of relationship, there has to be a mutual consent and to send the message that sexual harassment, again, is not acceptable, it doesn't matter where it happened. Thank you. Uh, so as Councilmember Levine uh, alluded to a few weeks ago, uh, I introduced a couple of uh, bills. One is uh, geared towards nonprofit organizations in the city that receive city funding, making sure that they are reporting uh, their incidents of sexual harassment and and then what they're doing about that sexual harassment and making that public because it's really important to be transparent. I agree with the council member that we should also do that at the city council level. But I have another bill that says that if there is an agency where there is a pattern of sexual harassment and nothing is being done about it, it is being tolerated at that agency, that we would reserve the right to uh, withdraw funding from that organization because there has to be teeth in this. People have to know we mean business. This is serious stuff. And I don't just come to this because of the moment that is so incredibly important happening in this country right now. But I, as a young man at a nonprofit agency, was sexually harassed by the executive director of that agency. It was incredibly scary. It was unclear who I could go to, if I could go to anyone. That's why it's incredibly important that there is a safe space to go to where you know you're going to be listened to and heard and believed, but also you're not going to be punished because I was fired after I filed a sexual harassment complaint. Um, 
just so proud of the eight years I've spent here. So besides my mother and my sister, I'm making sure I'm always oriented properly. People like uh, Julissa Ferris Copeland, Lori Cumbo, um, Melissa Marfarito, helping me uh, make sure I understand that no issue, no, there's no such thing as women's issues. All issues are women's issues. Uh, people like Helen Rosenthal, co-chair of the uh, Women's uh, Caucus, making sure that issues uh, move forward was important to me. Uh, being a, a black man, understanding that uh, subconsciously I had to learn how to shop while being followed. I had to learn to ignore uh, racist comments that I heard. Uh, and I brought that to say when uh, the, the legend, Ms. Burke, did the Me Too movement and all that came, I think the one thing that we all could do immediately and I tried to do was believe. Just believe what is being told to you. And as I spoke to other women around me, I was astonished by what I heard, even worse than what I, what I heard, what they had to deal with just to survive. This was nothing new. It had always, always been there. And, and the one thing silver lining hope comes out of it is now that it's exposed, there will be accountability and there will be change culturally in how we do things. So I support my colleagues' bills. I'm proud that the city council, thankfully, hasn't heard the scandals that we've heard uh, from up top, and I hope that it never will. But these kind of bills are important, and us, as cisgendered men, uh, making sure that we are not a part of a culture that is allowing this to continue. So fortunately and unfortunately for me, I have two roles. I have the role as a, a legislator, but the role as a father and a community figure and a black male, which makes me ultimately responsible for having young black men model the behavior that we would like for them to see. So there is this fallacy, uh, I, many of you may not know, but I've played basketball a little bit, right? So there's this, <laughs> there's this fallacy that there is language and behavior that's acceptable and it falls under the umbrella of locker room talk. So we have to begin to dismantle the idea that that's even remotely acceptable. Um, I, uh, so that's first and foremost. I have a bill now uh, that would make it, um, that would be a law that would, any small business would have to detail in their business what constitutes sexual harassment and a hotline number to call. So every business in the city of New York would have a checklist so you can walk by that and see whether or not what you're feeling actually meets the mandate of what constitutes sexual harassment and you could call on that. I mean, I feel sick to my stomach every day when I turn the news on and I see what's happening all over the country, as Councilmember Levine said, the different industries that we're seeing. I want to thank Councilmember Van Bramer for the package of bills he put forward and Councilmember Rosenthal and Levine for the announcement they made today on the Steps City Hall, combating this within the council, but also other agencies and nonprofits across the city. Of course, sexual harassment is unacceptable, sexual violence is unacceptable. But also the things that I think I witness, and I have done my best to call people out when I see it, women being catcalled on the streets of New York City, being hollered at, yelled at, ogled at, talked at, it's really gross. And it's something that I don't have to experience. When I walk down the street, I don't worry about crossing the street to avoid a group of people catcalling me. We need to, of course, ensure that our policies have teeth to them, we also, have, we also have to change the culture so that uh, men do not feel like in a public setting they can act or behave in any way towards someone else because they have power and domination over them. We need to change that. Um, I'm just curious really quickly uh, to Councilman Richards. You called for the creation of an independent body to address uh, sexual harassment? I didn't mean body, but in the HR department or... Within with the city? Within the city. Doesn't the Commission on Human Rights already do that, or are you talking about something? Well, I'm talking about within the council body. Okay. Or e so within the council's body. But yes, there are ways to make sure that even within that department that, you know, it's it's more prevalent that the public knows that it actually exists as well. Right. So yes. So Thank right. you for clarifying. Um, it, it, anyone who has questions that they've written out on an index card, if you would pass them to uh, the people at the back of the room at this point. Um, and I am going to move on to the subject of anti-violence and criminal justice, and I'm going to start with you, Councilman Richards. And since I have you here, and also uh, since Councilman Johnson is here, I, I thought it might be good to ask um, if you would, I, I know the other candidates have committed to this, if you would 
commit to um, bringing the Right to Know Act to the floor for a vote if you were elected speaker, and if the mayor were to veto it, would you seek to override the veto? Just since we're here. So I, I have personal experience in this. My, my first experience coming into the world as a teenager, I was actually stopped and frisked, and I didn't know anything better. You know, the police said, do you have anything in your pocket? And I went into my pocket and actually guns were drawn on me. Um, so I have some experience in this. Um, I, I don't have to speak up about this academically, uh, and it wasn't my last experience, obviously, with stop and frisk. So in terms of your question to the Right to Know Act, absolutely. Uh, this is not a mind-boggling uh, bill. I, I think it just makes common sense. If you treat people correctly, there will be no consequences. But to stop unjustifiably black men and women in the trans community, uh, unjustifiably, uh, people need to be held accountable. So if the mayor was to try to veto this bill, absolutely we would fight to teeth, tooth and nail to ensure that we overrode that veto. Uh, but I think it is critical uh, to ensuring that we're building trust with the police and communities that these uh, two bills, that the package moves forward. And you, Councilman Johnson? I, I feel like I've already committed to this and talked about no, it in many other debates. The answer is yes and yes. I mean, not to be more nuanced, but I do want to respect Councilman, Richard, Councilman Torres and Reynoso and their negotiations and the advocates in the process and the police department. That's not me backing away from it. But if I'm speaker, if any of us are speaker, we have to talk to the two colleagues who are involved, talk to the advocates as the current speaker has been doing and figure out where things are. I don't really know where things are right now. I know what I read on Politico, but I don't really know what's actually <laughs> happening behind closed doors in negotiations. No one's telling me that. So if I'm speaker, I'm gonna have to get up to speed uh, and figure that out. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'll move on to the actual question now. Um, elected officials, advocates, and community members are pushing for greater police accountability and transparency, obviously. Um, recently, two NYPD officers were indicted on first-degree rape charges for raping a handcuffed 18-year-old woman inside their police van in Brooklyn. I'm sure we've all heard about this. Um, trans and gender nonconforming New Yorkers, particularly those of color, experience frequent negative interactions with the NYPD, and immigrant women, particularly in this climate, may feel less likely to report crimes out of a fear of deportation, specifically things like domestic violence. Um, what changes to NYPD policies would you propose to change or address these problems? Um, and how do you plan on working with stakeholders to address the NYPD policies that impact these groups, women of color, immigrant women, and gender nonconforming New Yorkers? And I'll start with you, Councilman Richards. Uh, first off, we need to get this body cameras program rolled out right away. I think it's critical in ensuring that there's more uh, transparency around what's going on with police and their interactions with uh, all communities. I think secondly, it's gonna be critical that we strengthen once again, capacity of local organizations, right? Because people, are, pe even as people deal with elected officials, right? You know, there's always this trust, but then there could be mistrust, right? So I think it's critical that as we move forward that we build capacity in a lot of communities uh, that are underserved and represent uh, these constituencies to ensure that there are places that people can go uh, where they feel they can report these things and we can be, in the, in the organizations in particular, can be liaisons between uh, the communities. I think also there's a lot more work we have to do around the CCRB. I think we have to add teeth to the CCRB. Too many people are reporting things um, and they're not, uh, they're not, people are not being held accountable. And I think that that's where the culture shift absolutely needs to happen. Individuals who engage in activities that are targeting communities uh, should be held accountable. And I think if we send that message strongly, then we'll see a lot of this reduced. But I think body cameras, community policing, um, making sure that's rolled out in every community is gonna be a critical piece in this strategy in addressing this issue. I, I will continue working to invest more resources to establish more police community initiatives. I was arrested in 1989 in El Diario La Prensa wrote an editorial saying there's no freedom in 181st. And I was represented by Center for Constitutional Rights, John Gibbs, who was a professor at Mega Evers. 
So I've been organizing for since the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and we have seen how much progress we have made in the last four years. Being able to see how the NYPD was able to retrain all the forces in the last few months, in the last year, is progress. Being able to get more reform on the stop and frisk. Those are things that we at the council can say that we were part of that solution. However, that's not enough. Police officers, they have to be more accountable. They have to be more transparent. I think as I agree with the, with the battery camera, it's something that we should be expanding. It's not only should be manipulated or controlled when the police want to activate those cameras. It should be working 24 seven during the time that the police officers that they are patrolling our street. And we need to expand our police community relationship in the city. Uh, so I, I come from Queens, and we have an incredibly diverse uh, community, uh, obviously immigrant rich, um, and a very, very large and growing uh, trans-Latina population, in particular in Woodside, Jackson Heights, Corona, Elmhurst. And I have seen uh, firsthand how uh, members of that community uh, definitely feel uh, and are the subject of great violence. Uh, on the streets far too often, but oftentimes lack the trust to go to the police department if there is an incident. We had an attack on a trans Latina, a, a woman who was undocumented, uh, a violent attack just last year in Woodside, Queens. We were out there in full force to make sure that this couldn't happen, uh, but we've got to do more to make sure that the patrol guide is clear on, on how uh, our communities uh, are to be interacted with and respected. And also, I would just add one very specific point. Uh, there has been this horrific practice of if condoms are found uh, on people who are stopped, that there is the presumption of guilt and of criminal activity. Uh, that has to be stopped right away. There should be no assumptions made. If someone has a condom uh, on them, particularly a trans Latina who's on Roosevelt Avenue, doesn't make a difference, a damn bit of difference what time it is of night. Uh, there should be no presumption of, of any criminal activity. It is a good thing that people have condoms on them uh, and not a bad thing. Is that something that you can, uh, a change that can be made at the city level, or is that a state law change that has to Oh, I happen? think we have the ability to impact that with the NYPD, absolutely. Yeah, often um, I'm accused of being too activist, uh, and I say thank you very much. <laughs> um, and, and I say, yes, I'm an activist that achieves, I'm an activist that produces, and I say, what of my activism has been produced that you disagree with? That's when people usually go silent, and so, uh, when we talk about stop, question, and frisk and policing, that is a place that I had demonstrable leadership on. And I always, it's amusing to me that it's talked about as if that leadership and the type and the style would have somehow not helped that happen. And so uh, it's important because, as my colleague just mentioned, uh, the, as alluded to, the Community Safety Act was the largest expansion of LGB and TGNC um, community up until my colleague, uh, council member, um, Councilmember Johnson, and I say that because it was so important. Without the trans voice, we probably wouldn't have had it done. When they came and testified about what my colleague just spoke about, about police going in their bras and finding condoms and charging them prostitution, that moved me, and I had no idea about it until they spoke up. And that was the importance to me of inclusivi inclusivity, making sure that all voices are heard. And as I said, I've been black for a pretty long time, uh, and so I understand the issues with policing. Uh, just to answer your question really briefly, all the things that my colleagues said are correct. You can't legislate morality, and we have to make the environment change. The two areas where we haven't done that, we have done some good things I want to give credit, but there are two areas where we haven't done that, where this administration just has failed. Right? One is transparency. We've gone backwards uh, when it comes to things like 50A and accountability. Uh, we haven't done much there. I guarantee you, if officers started being held accountable like other people who are in our city, for actions that are illegal, immoral, and cause death, there will be immediate change in how people and the community uh, deal with each other. So just a quick point of privilege, I'm the only one on stage who's actually been black longer than Jelani. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I agree with all my colleagues, but just would like to add the small caveat that um, Enforcement is a big issue. 
and I think we have to be prepared uh, to look at um, characterizing these negative interactions uh, with protected classes as hate crimes and really forcing the community to have a discussion around the level that it rises to when someone is uh, from, from those protected classes or those communities is harassed. So I would really focus on trying to bring uh, transparency and bring emphasis on those negative interactions, especially with law enforcement and, uh, uh, and, in, that, you know, and in the department as, as hate crimes. I'm glad Councilmember Van Bramer brought up condoms as evidence uh, because it is such a big issue. You know, Laura, the council did do something on this, which was, I believe it was Councilmember Williams and Menchaca had been working with the five DAs in the five boroughs as well as the NYPD on changing policy. It took a while to get all the DAs to agree with each other on how they were gonna handle it, but it's a big issue. In my district, I have Christopher Street which has been a community center point for a lot of LGBT youth of color who have come down there to be on the piers and to be on Christopher Street. And one thing that the 6th Precinct has done, uh, which is a local police precinct that covers that area, is they've worked with nonprofit organizations like The Door and other organizations on how to interact with uh, young LGBT people of color in a real way, real police community relations. We have to build models of that all over the city on how we go about how we go about doing that. We have to not criminalize people for survival sex, which is a big thing in New York City. We have to recognize that that is a thing, and that uh, people are not doing that typically because they want to. They're doing it because they're trying to survive because of the oppression and marginalization that they faced. So there's a whole series of things that needs to be done. Criminal justice is probably the biggest issue in New York City, along with affordability, and those two come in hand in hand. Well, you made reference to this horrific case in Brooklyn, and the defense of this officer is incredible, is that it was consensual. <laughs> and uh, it turns out there's a loophole in the law that it's illegal for a correction officer to engage in sexual activity with someone who's detained, but not a police officer. So that's allowing them to make that defense. Now, we, ha we have a colleague, Mark Traeger, from Brooklyn, who has um, a bill that would put a stop to that. Uh, there should be no ability to use a defense like that. It's, absur it's absurd. You talked about the challenge of the undocumented interacting with law enforcement, and we've made big progress here. ICE used to roam around Rikers at will, and we have largely kicked them out, except in very, very, very narrow, strict cases. Basically, they have to have a, an order from a judge. Uh, so that's, that's been a huge improvement, and we've put in place policies that prevent ICE from going into our public schools, our public hospitals. The courts, however, are a battleground, and they are state-controlled, they're not city-controlled. There have been several cases, one last week, where an undocumented person has showed up for a court date having nothing to do with immigration and has been uh, detained by ICE in the court. If you're not safe in a court, then um, we have a huge problem, and that's going to result in undocumented New Yorkers refusing to interact with law enforcement, even if they are victims of crime or, or witnesses of crime. So we have to get ICE out of the courts. That has to be a safe space for every New Yorker, no matter the documentation. Just one last reminder, if you have an index card, can you just please pass it back? Our next question is on community support and opportunity. I'm going to start with you, Councilman Rodriguez. A growing number of individuals and families are being pushed out of their homes and neighborhoods due to increasing rent prices and evictions. A 2014 IBO report confirmed that the overwhelming majority of families entering the shelter system, 93% from 2002 to 2012, were families led by women. Domestic violence accounts for about one-fourth of shelter entries, closely behind evictions and overcrowding. Homelessness and, and insecure housing for trans women in GNC communities has been complacent long before the more recent homelessness crisis in the New York City began. How will you address the lack of affordable housing, putting many New Yorkers, especially women in GNC communities, people who are domestic and intimate partner violence survivors, at risk of becoming homeless and housing insecure? I believe that <laughs> there's not a secret that housing is a crisis. That today we have an average of 16% of a student going to New York City public school that they, they live in some type of shelters. 
we have role model. We have, let's say, Broadway housing, uh, that 155th in Nashville. It's a new model for affordable housing where a great percentage were people who were homeless. And they've been able to show that they know how to build housing and maintain those, those apartments with a quality that they deserve. I believe that we have to keep working with a public and private partnership to increase the subsidy so that we can increase the percentage of affordable housing that now we will be able to bring to our community. Many areas of our city being uh, gentrified. Long Island City, Brooklyn, Harlem is no black majority, it's not majority black anymore. The same thing can happen in Northern Manhattan if we don't put the tool in place to be sure that when we build affordable housing, we build for the average media income of our community, understanding that more than 40% of New Yorkers are living on the poverty line today. And we had to build not only for those who make the $100,000 or $80,000 or the $30,000, also for those percentage who live on the poverty, on the poverty line. So, um, First, I just want to say uh, I'm proud of the work that we've done with the homeless shelters that we have in our district where uh, some folks are protesting and screaming at the women and children uh, outside of these shelters. Uh, I've said in my district we are not doing that. We are never doing that. Um, and instead, I've gone in uh, to the shelters, met with the women uh, and their children, and sought how we can help them uh, to achieve the stable and permanent housing that they're looking for. Uh, the second thing I'll say is that obviously uh, we have an opportunity and an obligation that when folks talk about affordable housing and they talk about rezonings, that we use those as opportunities uh, to drill down, go further, and provide meaningful affordable housing, deeper levels, including for those uh, who are formerly homeless. So that's what we're looking to do, uh, even in a neighborhood uh, like Long Island City that I represent, uh, where previous rezonings led to zero affordable housing. We're going to correct that past mistake and going forward make sure that everyone can afford to live in every neighborhood. Can you read the question again, please? A growing number of individuals and families are being pushed out of their homes and neighborhoods due to increasing rent prices and evictions. A 2014 IBO report confirmed that the overwhelming majority of families in serving the shelter system, 93% from 2002 to 2012, were families led by women. Domestic violence accounts for about one-fourth of shelter entries, closely behind evictions and overcrowding. Homelessness and insecure housing for trans women and GNC communities has been complacent before, long before the more recent homelessness crisis in New York City began. How will you address the lack of affordable housing, putting many New Yorkers, especially women and GNC communities, people who are domestic and intimate partner violence survivors, at risk of becoming homeless and housing insecure? Thank you. Um, just for clarity, that's not Trump that did that. Um, that's us here in New York City. So we have to be clear about that. Um, as the housing chair, this is another area where I provided demonst demonstrable leadership. My voice has been outsized. One of the my proudest moments is when Association for Neighborhood Housing Development gave me the Housing Champion Award after I pushed on MIH and mandatory inclusion in housing. Ultimately voted no because we didn't do all that we could have done. And, and many of our voices have been vindicated because they're now making the changes that we had asked. Unfortunately, we lost time. And so we lost the ability to, to add housing. I would like to review the MIH and see if there's changes that we can make to take away things like member, to prevent some of the confusion around member deference. That's a longer conversation. But I'm very proud that I had a domestic violence bill uh, that now codifies uh, in human rights law uh, that you cannot dim dis discriminate against someone because of the domestic violence. And I'm, that's a very proud moment. I just want to shout out Luke Fiddler, who did a lot of good work around uh, runaway youth. And it's important that we continue to push them, as my colleague mentioned, survival sex, particularly uh, around uh, women and the uh, LGBT, TGNC community is uh, very big. Uh, we have to have additional income targeted housing. Uh, there is so many things that I can discuss around this and I'm out of time. The state needs to give us more power in the city so that we can do what it is that we need to do. Lastly, we need to uh, make sure our housing plan matches the people who are suffering the most right now. It doesn't, 
We have two plans, a homelessness plan, a housing plan, two commissioners, housing commissioner, homelessness commissioner, two deputy mayors, one for housing, one for deputy mayor. That doesn't make sense. They are connected. We have to discuss it like they are. So, <clears throat> first of all, uh, the city of New York has done a tremendous amount over the last eight years as it relates to addressing gun violence. But what's not being stated is the number one violence in the city of New York is domestic violence and has been the root cause for a lot of the gun violence that we see. Uh, I took or was elected with my eye keenly on being a good fiscal steward. And what I know is that it takes three times as much money to temporarily house a family than it does to provide long-term, sustainable, affordable housing for a family. So the money is actually there. A redirection of those funds into long-term, sustainable housing over a long period of time will give us the result that we need. And those families that you mentioned, through domestic violence and through other means, need not only housing, but they need support services so that they can remain in long-term sustainable housing. I'm glad you brought up that point of support services. Can you give an overview as to what support do you think would be best then and implemented? So there are so many services, whether it's, whether it's in and around supporting uh, uh, financial savings, whether it's in and around education, whether it's in and around mental health. There are so many needs that the chronically homeless face that they can't expect to be housed long-term and sustainably when there's so much crisis in the unit. And you mentioned families that are obviously in crisis that find themselves in the, in, in the shelter system. They need support services, not only while they're there, but once they are finding long-term sustainable housing, there need to be support services so that they can remain housed. So the very first bill I passed in the city council was a bill that said if you are a domestic violence victim, you are deemed presumptively eligible to go into DHS. What does that mean? Previously, before uh, my bill passed into law, if you were in a DV shelter, domestic violence shelter, you were capped out after 120 days. 120 days, you had to leave that shelter. You couldn't stay any longer. You then would need to go up to the Bronx to the intake center for DHS if you were a woman with your children, be interviewed by DHS in front of your children about why should they transfer you to DHS. It was a demeaning, horrifying process. And so my bill corrected that and said, if you're a woman, if you're anyone, and you're going from a domestic violence shelter, you are deemed presumptively eligible to get into a homeless shelter without having to go through that process. That was the first bill that I passed in the city council. Everyone said it. I'm not going to repeat what everyone said. Homelessness is probably the biggest crisis we're facing right now in New York City. 62,000 people in the shelter system tonight, almost 10,000 people living on the streets. It's an affordability crisis. Councilmember Levine deserves a lot of credit for his right to council bill. It's going to make a huge difference. We have to get our rent laws back into our power and our control. I was arrested inside the Capitol in Albany with Giovanni Williams and other folks protesting our rent laws because we need to ensure that New Yorkers have a safe, affordable place to live and should not be displaced and pushed out of their neighborhoods. Well, you correctly assessed the homelessness crisis as being in great measure a crisis of eviction. We do have an epidemic of eviction in this city. And for decades, it's been driven by the fact that in New York City's housing court, there has been no right to counsel. So if you as a tenant did not have money to pay for an attorney, you were on your own. And so less than 10% of tenants have had attorneys historically in the city. Almost every landlord does. The result has been over 20,000 evictions a year. And I am so proud that we have put an end to that by making New York City the first place in America to have a right to counsel for all tenants facing eviction in housing court. And this is going to be a game change for tenants. It's going to take a couple years to build out, but already we have seen a 27% drop in the number of evictions in New York City. And, and an incredible phenomena that people on the front lines are reporting, legal aid attorneys, the number of cases, of eviction cases being brought by landlords is starting to drop because they used to get away with never facing an attorney on the other side. And so it was very easy for them to bring frivolous cases. And that's changing for them. Um, so we need to get the word out. Everyone knows you have a right to counsel in criminal court because we see it on, on law and order. But now we need to get the word out to our communities, to our neighbors. Uh, the system is set up on 311. So if nothing else, you can call 311 and the operator will know how to connect, hopefully not you, but someone you know, 
um, to an attorney if you're facing an eviction or if you're facing landlord harassment. Uh, I could talk more about this if we have time, but we need the help of activists like you to help other New Yorkers understand this important new right. So uh, I'm proud to chair the zoning committee, and one of the things that uh, we saw when I came in was developers rezoning neighborhoods without being mandated to put in affordable housing. So now when a developer comes before the city council with an application and wants a little bit more density of height and want a zoning change, they are required to put in affordable housing. One of the things we are doing differently now, um, which we have to get more aggressive about, and the HPD changed their term sheets, the Housing Preservation and Development Corporation, to now require 10%, 5 to 10% of units in these rezonings be set aside for homeless families. One thing we can do is perhaps look at increasing that number more, right? Secondly, um, we should look at public housing. You know, we're not setting aside enough units for homeless families uh, in public housing every year. So that, that number, I, I believe, has increased, but we can be doing a whole lot more there. Lastly, I had a rezoning recently in the Rockaways, which is going to produce thousands of units, and I'm proud to say one of the projects uh, that is that we're going to break ground with with related uh, companies is going to encompass around 300 units for formerly homeless women veterans uh, with families, and that is going to be an amazing uh, project because it not only is housing, but we're having Win come in, which is run by Christine Quinn and some other uh, wraparound organizations come in to make sure that services are being provided uh, to our formerly homeless uh, women as well, who are in the who who are, I mean, homeless women who are in the system. Uh, who will now be able to have permanent housing located. I'll lastly say that supportive housing is also a critical piece of this equation. The state needs to do more. Assembly member uh, uh, Hevesy has a bill that needs to be passed, uh, which will provide more subsidy uh, for families as well. Um, on, this is on the subject of budget and governance, uh, under Speaker Mark Viverito, the City Council successfully negotiated its on-time budget um, with three women of color negotiating it. It's like the opposite of Albany. Um, city Council Finance Chair Julissa Ferreras, the City Council Finance Director Latanya McKinney, and the Speaker herself. There are far fewer women in the City Council next term, as we've already said, and no trans members in a City Council that is lacking in gender diversity and in a City Council that doesn't reflect the City of New York how do you each intend to build leadership among, among both members and your most senior leadership team that is inclusive of cis and trans women and women of color in particular? I'm starting with you, Councilman Van Bramer. Thank you very much. Well, first, I think all of us should take a moment to appreciate the fact that uh, for the last 12 years, a woman has led the New York City Council, both Christine Quinn and Melissa Mark Viverito. So I think we should all give a big round of applause to 12 years of <laughs> female leadership. Um, and uh, uh, what I will uh, uh, definitely pledge to you is that if I uh, am lucky enough to be the city council speaker, that we would definitely have a senior leadership team and a leadership team that is a majority uh, people of color and women, and that is at the highest levels. Uh, it is absolutely incredibly important that we uh, do that, that we uplift uh, and, and empower. Um, I also want to say, though, that um, all of us uh, up here are, are related to women, and yet patriarchy still exists. Uh, women are 50% uh, of the workforce, so none of us deserves a gold star uh, for making sure uh, that women are in these positions and roles. Uh, the truth is they always should be uh, in these roles. So if I am the speaker, we'll make sure that we have uh, a leadership team that is representative of the city uh, and with a special emphasis on women in particular because having 11 women out of 51 in the New York City Council is a tragedy um, in, in how we will govern uh, for the next four years, uh, but also for all of the young women who are out there looking at this body, it is absolutely imperative that we fix this now, and we all do what we can uh, to make sure that women are in leadership positions, which I've always done at the community board level uh, and other levels, and that's what I would do as the speaker as well. Oh, uh, sorry, I, to interrupt, um, w and you can debate the merits of whether or not this is valuable or not, but um, 
Would you commit to making a, a woman or a person of color uh, a, or a trans person um, the leadership of one of the po most powerful committees, the land use and the finance committee? Is that something that you would commit to? You well, can say uh, why not. Uh, I, I would commit to having a trans person in that role if we had a trans member of the New York City Council. But I, I think that, uh, look, I have committed to having uh, as diverse uh, a leadership team as possible, including at the highest levels. And yes, I think women and people of color have to occupy, uh, if I'm the speaker, uh, some of those positions. Just repeat the question again. Oh, um, um, essentially, um, how do you intend to build leadership among both the members and your most senior leadership team, if you're elected the speaker, that is inclusive of cis and trans women and women of color <coughs> in particular? Thank you very much. I have um, probably one of the more uh, diverse um, staffs ever since I came on. I wanted to make sure that happened uh, for the past eight years. Uh, white. Black, Jewish, LGBT, everyone mixed in right now, almost half of my staff are women. It's very important to me uh, to make sure I'm not just talking about something, but I'm, that I'm actually doing it. Uh, it is appalling that there are only 11 women in the city council, two Latinas, one Asian. Uh, the data shows that when women run, they win as much as men, which means there's something structurally that's preventing that from happening, and we have to try to fix that. Uh, I am committed to, it, if I'm speaker, any deal that's being made, uh, those leadership positions have to be diverse. We can't go from three powerful women running the budget to none. And so there are a few powerful positions. We know what they are. I'm committed that they are diverse and including uh, women's voices, including the staff. As I mentioned, uh, it's not about women's issues. It's about every issue, making sure that women are there at the highest level so that their voice is heard so that we can make a decision uh, that makes the most sense. I put out a white paper uh, a few weeks ago. In that paper, it praised uh, the current speaker for what she's done. I want to build on that. I want to perhaps have an internship and scholarship in her name so that we can have a pipeline of young women coming up and hopefully that number will increase and increase rapidly. So as co-chair of the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus, in my first term in that role, myself and Richie Torres uh, demanded a full accounting of ethnicity across the board in the New York City Council. Um, and commit, were committed to uh, what we saw anecdotally, which didn't represent necessarily, especially in the leadership role, uh, in central staff, a commitment to increase those numbers. Uh, we got the accounting back last week, and it shows that we've doubled in minority hires over her tenure, so I want to give her full credit for that. I would commit to doing that to include trans as well as women in that profile to be increased in the body in the same fashion that the speaker, the current speaker, was able to commit to doing that and getting results uh, that matched our needs as a caucus. Uh, the answer is yes. Right now, my district director is an amazing African-American woman who I do not cross. She tells me what to do, and she's just uh, she's one of the people who runs my district office, uh, and she's been with me since day one. And I think that shows, you know, she's like the person who runs my district office. So I'm really grateful for her leadership. I would commit uh, to, as Councilmember Bremer said, a majority of the leadership team be women and people of color. I think that's really important, as well as key committees. If we look about what's happening in this country right now, uh, you saw in Virginia a few weeks ago, we almost flipped the General Assembly there. Almost all the seats we took were women who took on Republicans. Last night, a special election in Georgia in the suburbs of Atlanta, a woman flipped the seat from Democrat to Republican. A 27-year-old lesbian in Oklahoma, a seat that Donald Trump won by 40 points three weeks ago, she flipped it from Republican to Democrat. Women need to be out there uh, running for office, and we need to do all we can to encourage women to run for office and be in leadership positions. Well, I'm very proud of the fact that um, my staff at the City Council is today and has been for the last four years, majority women, majority people of color, and that's been true of every team that I managed in my career in the nonprofit sector before this, and I would continue that record if I'm lucky enough to be speaker. 
um, by assuring we meet those goals in the staff of the council and in the leadership within the body. Um, but the time to start working to get more women into the body in 2021 is now. We cannot wait till two or three years from now. We have to begin to empower strong women candidates, to encourage them, to support them. It is not easy to run for office. You have to raise money. It's a complicated undertaking. And we, all of us, need to begin to look for candidates to succeed us. I think we're all term limited in this term. And we need to support candidates in other districts, strong women, transgender, and of course, gender nonconforming candidates throughout the city. The time to start is now. I'll start with a citywide view. First, we need to look at agencies across the city. We need to make sure that there's perhaps a gender diversity compliance officer across agencies, making sure that there's accountability and that we're diversifying our ranks. CWA 1180 also had a bill uh, that I would hope to revisit. Uh, what we're seeing across city agencies right now is there are people of co color, women of color, trans community in there, but they're not being promoted to the managerial positions. And we need to take a close look at what's going on across this city. There are more than enough qualified women of color and people in a trans community that should not just necessarily be workers, but should be uh, uh, lifted up into the uh, highest heights of government as well. Uh, secondly, I would commit to certainly looking at the budget negotiating team and leadership to make sure that every woman in the council certainly uh, has a role in both places. Uh, lastly, I'll say, listen, I, I don't want to sit up here and lie and say that I'm going to select who has the finance and land use committee because we all have power brokers that we're talking to at play. But I do think it is the responsibility of all of us who sit here, who whomever it is who sits in front of uh, the people who will also have a say in where committees go to ensure that we are advocating to ensure that women are in a lead role and are taking prime committees in the council as well. New York City has a great opportunity to lead by example, to be a role model to the whole nation and to the whole world. We can celebrate that we are the only city probably in the whole world in the developed nation that we can say that we've been built by people that come from all over the world. Only in New York City we can say that someone like myself that came here at the age of 18 where I was speaking the language, was able to make it through college, being a teacher, co-founder to a school, now at the council for a year, and hopefully the new speaker. However, we need to be realistic. Think, imagine the first day when we had the budget section at the council. Look in the right side and look the faces of the attendants there. They are mainly white male in that room. So we can leave our society much better for the future generation. <laughs> we fought Donald Trump for many reasons. One, he had built a white male cabinet. If the speaker is white, New York City will have the mayor, the controller, and the speaker being white. We want to lead by example. We have overqualified candidates that they're ready to be the speaker who are candidates of color. But regardless if the speaker is myself, a person of color, or one of my white colleagues, we need to be sure that the leadership of the council represents the LGBTQ community, people of color in real leadership, not in the middle, but in the top. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna start with you, Councilman Jamani Williams. What role will you have in securing legislative priorities for members and ensuring policies that address the needs of women in communities of color are advanced? That's a, that's a great question. Like I've been saying, I think all the issues we're talking about have intersectionality, and that's why it's so important that um, I feel like I don't discuss this as particular women's issues. Again, all of the issues we discussed have intersectionality, and I, sometimes I feel like, um, uh, unfortunately, someone like my mom has the burden of doing so much, but then someone like my mom may not be in this power decision-making, uh, even though she has a lot of the burden. So it is important that there is such a diverse leadership that there are, there are so many things I've learned uh, from 
uh, my staff, a woman, my deputy chief of staff is a woman. So many things that I may not have understood without those voices around. I may not have understood the importance of including uh, the LGBT TGNC community in the Community Safety Act if they weren't included. Those voices have to be included or else the policies you make don't include them, so uh, and, and, and it has a deleterious effect. So the biggest thing I want to do is make sure that I surround myself with that diverse community. Uh, one of the most eye-opening uh, uh, hearings I heard was something Councilmember Johnson brought up. It was catcalling. I literally, just being a cisgender man, didn't understand until I heard it that day. And it dawned on me that from the time you start to become a teenager, when you go for some bread or you go to work, you're dealing with things for almost your entire life that open eyes to me. And it's so important to make sure that people are around me that don't look like me, sometimes disagree with me, uh, so that I can have a clear vision of the decisions that need to be made. The best, most important pieces of legislation that I've been able to author in the New York City Council have been informed by rooms just like this. So I don't profess to be a genius or guru, but I do have connectivity with people in different demographics. My partnerships with the Women's Caucus has yielded an understanding and knowledge about what the city can do and should do in partnership. So I, can, I, from a speaker's perspective, will continue those partnerships which have gotten me to a place of understanding and being a consensus builder within the New York City Council. I think it's really about not being uh, paternalistic. And what I mean by that is it's about really listening and listening to a diverse set of voices and knowing that, you know, I have to recognize, and I've said this at other forums, that I have privilege because of the color of my skin and because of my gender. When I walk into a Duane Reed, no one's following me around thinking I'm gonna shoplift. And when we talk about these issues, it's important that the leadership is not coming from me if I'm speaker, or probably from any of the folks up here if they're speaker, but from the communities that we're trying to help and give an impact to. That means listening. That means understanding these issues. And that means sometimes stepping aside and letting other people lead. There's a saying that I, that I tell myself, uh, that someone has told me, which is, um, does it need to be said, does it need to be said by me, and does it need to be said now? And I ask myself that question sometimes. And s most of the time the answer is no, no, and no. There are other people that should say it. Well, you know, we're, we're tragically down to only 11 women in the city council. We were up to 19 in, in a previous era. Um, there's a little bit of silver lining here. It's, it's, it's 11 incredible women, including four newly elected women, uh, leaders of color, uh, who are going to immediately be stars, I have no doubt, in the body. We need to empower that group of 11 women. We need to empower the Women's Caucus. I'm committed to giving them a full-time staff person. This has not happened before uh, in previous city councils. Um, we, we need to take this value for marginalized communities into the fight over a budget which is about to move into a storm. We, uh, we had to do a budget amendment in November that cut $200 million out of revenue. We're facing cuts from Washington. We need to make sure that the voices of marginalized communities now are heard at this time when people on the right are going to be telling New York City to cut services, services that impact communities of color, that impact the LGBT community. This is a time where we need progressive leadership in our body, in the city council, to stand up, listening to the voices in this room and in the communities we represent, to fight where it matters to preserve resources for the communities who need it. So I'll say the answer lies right here. All of the people who co-sponsored this tonight are going to be critical pieces. The top-down approach is not necessarily the approach the speaker has to take, I think, from the ground up. So when I say that, I think policies that perhaps people in this room come up with uh, will be important, because like Jamani said, we don't know everything, and I don't pretend to know everything, but there may be policies that are critical to you uh, that we can certainly move in the council, and I think that's where we should start. Secondly, I'll speak about the Young Women's Initiative, which I'm very proud of the work I remember you uh, you are a little nervous at the uh, state of the city, but you kick butt. Um, <laughs> but I think we should look at that platform and not only look at it, but if there are monetary ask attached to those things, we need to think about fully funding those things. So I think it's important as males 
who sit up here with privilege uh, that we look at the initiatives that the Young Women's Initiative have come up with, things that, th that are important to the Women's Caucus, uh, and that we certainly take them and prioritize them and make them the highest of the priorities we have in the council. I also commit to coming back here to meet with each and every group here or whoever uh, you so choose to make sure that we follow through on this commitment. So now we're going to start with a question. I started off with Williams. I did not answer this question. <laughs> Should I go? <laughs> How did that happen? Did we skip you, Dice? Did you answer this one? I don't think you died. But <laughs> what is it? No, no, hold on. What? No. What? What is the question? The question. Sorry, it's 20 debates no, no. we had. It's like <laughs> the question was, what role will you have in securing legislative priorities for members and ensuring policies that address the needs of women and communities of color are advanced? Well, first of all, like as I in my as I said before, that I'm one of 12 brothers and sisters, the first seven women. Now I have two daughters and my wife, so women run my life. <laughs> and when it comes to, you know, being in a school, I used to be in a school for 13 years. I have one of my former students here who used to, who now is a lawyer. So he can tell you about everything that we did, developing leadership among our students, not during the contract hours, but in the after school, in a Saturday program. I believe it is important to bring the process to create new legislation to the people. As we had a participatory budget, what I would do in January is that I would start also a legislation participatory initiative where we go to the grassroots community and open the process, working with some of the law school in NYU, Columbia, CUNY, invite those lawyers to work together in partnership with this institution to be sure that the whole process of legislation is more democratized, democratized as it is right now. Uh, so I want to uh, echo some of the comments of uh, Councilmember Johnson, and, and with the discussions going forward, I think we have to make sure uh, that women are centered uh, in those conversations and leading those conversations, and we're taking uh, a step uh, which sometimes we don't, which is to listen. Uh, I also want to say I've introduced a few different proposals. Uh, one is uh, gender and race audits, uh, but also uh, gender budgeting, which I think will uh, get us a long way uh, towards making sure that every single decision we make, whether it be legislative or budget, uh, is looked at uh, through the prism of how we are impacting uh, women, how we are impacting people of color, uh, and making sure that there is equity. And if we are doing those things and committed to race and gender audits and gender budgeting, then we will be able to do that in a way that we've never done it before. It's a level of commitment that we've never seen before. Uh, we don't have those things now. We need them absolutely. Uh, those are some of the things that we would do. So now we're gonna have our lightning round. It's a yes or a no question. Will you, I'm gonna start with you, Councilmember Carnegie, of course. Will you commit to staffing your senior team and city council central staff with plus 50% women and team BNC people? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm not gonna get ran out this room. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 It's an awesome goal. I hope to achieve it. Um, if you become the speaker, do you commit to uh, continue the speaker's commitment to young cis and trans girls and GNC young people of color um, to support the Young Women's Initiative and to work with the administration to ensure that the policies and programs that result from it are meaningfully implemented? Yes. 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 100%. Yes. Absolutely, check out my next chapter white paper. Whole, whole, whole section there about it. Yes. <laughs> All right, so gay men's health crisis, Sylvia Rivera Law, Law Project, Trans Latina Network, The Center, Make the Road New York, The Audrey Law Project, Anti-Violence Project, 
led a process that centers TGNC New Yorkers in determining policy solutions called Solutions Out of Struggle and Survival. If you become a speaker, do you commit to working with these organizations and community members in the creation, implementation, and evaluation of these policies? Yes. Hell yes. Yes. So because you mentioned her name, I just have to issue a fun fact. I actually shared a jail cell with Sylvia Rivera, uh, <laughs> which when, when I'm retired, I'm going to do a one-act play based on that night, because if you haven't spent a night in jail with Sylvia Rivera, you don't know what you're missing. The answer is yes to that question. <laughs> I have a simple absolutely. You can't top what he just said. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. Oh, really? <laughs> I haven't heard that before. Uh, um, we we are we've ran out of time or are running out of time, um, so we're not going to be able to get to the audience questions. But if I could, I'll I'll hold on to them and disseminate them widely to the other reporters who cover City Hall, so you won't escape having to answer them at some point in the near future. Um, and I want to invite up, if I could, just for a moment, um, uh, our Councilwoman uh, Rosenthal, just to say a few words. Yay. You know, I want to thank everyone here for doing this and then for coming out tonight. Um, it's great to recognize and acknowledge the fact that in the next council, um, there will be only 20% of the body uh, will represent 50% of the population. And we need to make sure that one of these men, uh, whoever becomes speaker, or there might be a little surprise. Just kidding. Uh, just kidding. Um, that whoever that whoever is the next speaker, um, that we continue to hold their feet to the fire every day, and I'm counting on you for that. I I do want to say the Women's Caucus interviewed all these men about a month ago now, and uh, I guess for all of you, I would say you've come a long way, baby. Um, I like these answers. Uh, you made some real commitments in our interviews with all of you. We appreciate that. Uh, those were tiny compared to what you're going to hear after January 3rd. Um, this Women's Caucus is going to rule. And um, <laughs> what we're going to do that because we need to make sure that at least 50% of the body next time are women after 2021. And um, very proud that I think, Donovan, you, you said that tonight. So I was really impressed. It's on you guys. You know, all 11 women have, um, have, have committed to mentoring uh, young women, uh, trans, uh, to come into the council, we will mentor you, call us, take us up on it. It's really hard work, and you have to start yesterday. So um, get on it. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Helen Rosenthal. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Laura and Shatia, for moderating. And of course, uh, thank you to all the city council members for uh, being here and for the work that you do. Although we know there can only be one, know that we have this live stream on video. We have it you know, uh, documented, transcribed, and we are committed and actually poised to helping uh, you with your strategies and implementation strategies, uh, even as city council members uh, within the district. I want to, of course, thank um, everyone here tonight, everyone here who watched through live stream and social media, and of course, all the organizations that work tirelessly uh, to put the one and only forum uh, that focuses on cis, trans, and gender nonconforming young people of color in New York City together, especially as the last forum uh, for these candidates. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank especially the team at Girls for Gender Equity. Amazing, amazing team. Uh, specifically, uh, I'll say Kylan Greer, thank you. 
And of course, we're here because of the tireless and fearless leadership of Sasha Ahuja. Thank you. And so as we close, I invite everyone to join us for a reception on the first floor from 8 to 9 p.m., yeah? All right, thank you so much.